right, great. Welcome everyone to another AO Trauma North America webinar on a Wednesday night. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about paraprosthetic hip proximal femur fracture management. My name is Mike Leslie. I'm an orthopedic trauma attending at Yale, and I'll be your moderator this evening. And we have two great faculty members who are here to share lots of knowledge about these very complex problems. Dr. Lisa Blackrick from Jacksonville, Florida, and Dr. Timothy Brown from Houston, Texas. So Dr. Blackrick is a trauma surgeon also, and Dr. Brown is a uh, primarily an adult reconstruction surgeon. So we should have some great debate back and forth here as far as how we're gonna go ahead and treat these cases. Just a few housekeeping things as we get started. So here are our disclosures. It does not endorse nor promote the use of any product, service of commercial entities. And the equipment used in this course that you'll see is for demonstration only in teaching purposes with the intent to enhance the learning experience. As far as how we do this on a webinar, utilizing Zoom. So all microphones have been muted and your video cameras are turned off so we cannot see what you're doing, but hopefully you're paying somewhat attention to us and uh, get involved and ask us some questions and some comments would be great. Uh, if you can send all of those questions and comments, and if you have any technical issues in particular, through the Q&A box um, at the top or bottom of your screen, we'll go ahead and uh, make sure someone is keeping an eye on that throughout the course of the evening. And we will get back to you with any, uh, any responses, or if you have great questions, we'll go ahead and bring those up uh, for the entire group this evening. Um, <clears throat> And the chat box itself, just note, it, that's just for the faculty and the staff on the meeting itself. So as an overview, the proximal femur paraprosthetic fracture webinar aims to improve the clinician's ability to critically evaluate these fractures and make sound treatment decisions. At the conclusion of tonight, the learner will be able to recognize in their practice whether or not a stem is loose or well-fixed. And in addition, the principles of fixation and revision surgery will be described and demonstrated with both case presentations and a practical presentation. So our learning objectives tonight, we're going to go ahead and hopefully improve your decision-making for loose or well-fixed stems with paraprosthetic fractures, identify options for fixation about proximal femur fractures, hopefully recognize some of the concepts of revision at a high level, and demonstrate a paraprosthetic plating system tonight. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Here's our agenda. Uh, we'll have, uh, I think the highlight of tonight will be the 30 minutes that we're able to spend going through cases, uh, really discussing some of the nitty gritty about some of these very difficult cases. And then we're also going to have a practical demonstration uh, that'll be just a little bit over 10 minutes that will uh, really be able to demonstrate some of the features of the specialty plates that are available and how you would go ahead and integrate those with a femoral stem in place and uh, some special circumstances around all this. And then hopefully we'll adjourn by 9.15 after uh, a robust conversation. So we'd ask the real question, why are we here tonight? Well, sometimes it's for these relatively non-displaced fractures that are lots of fun to deal with. Sometimes they're fractures that are really fun to deal with because they're fractures and we don't have to worry about those implants at all. We just need to fix the fracture. But then sometimes things get a little complicated and we get these fractures about stems where we're scratching our heads saying, is this thing loose? Where should this thing be well fixed? I don't even know. And then the really obvious ones, well, obviously this one's not stable within the bone. However, what can I possibly do to fix this? And if even if I fix it, how do I get a stable prosthesis in there? So, so this is really the, the spectrum of things we want to try to discuss tonight, shed a little, a little bit of light on, and really kind of take you through our thought process and uh, everything that we're doing around these fractures. So the questions that we're going to try to answer are fracture location. We all should be able to answer that. Whether a stem is cemented or press fit, we want to know it's, if it's loose or it's stable and that's within a cement mantle or not within a cement mantle. The quality of the bone always comes up. So is it good or bad bone? And then the bonus questions like what type of stem is it? Where does the stem usually ingrow? What type of articulation do we have? Do we need to deal with the articulation? <clears throat> Is it infected or aseptic? Is there wear about it? Is there bone loss? All of these things come up and become really important. And I think will be really highlighted in the very interesting cases that we've brought for you tonight. So we're gonna get started. Dr. Blackrick is gonna go ahead and take us through the classification 
of the proximal femur paraprosthetic fracture. So Lisa, take it away. All right. So as orthopedic surgeons, we always start with the classification system to see um, where the fracture occurs, where it exists, and then hopefully that guides our treatment options. So as we see, the Vancouver classification, which was introduced in 1995, uh, essentially had the fracture um, subdivided into three groups, A, B, and C, and this was based on location. So A was proximal, such as greater trochanter, uh, B was around the implant, and C was distal to the implant. The type Bs were then further subdivided, given that it included the implant into well-fixed implants, which were B1s, and then loose implants, which were B2s. If we had well-fixed implants, that was a little bit easier, especially for the trauma surgeons. But then when we go into the loose implants, we then have to look at the surrounding factors, such as the bone stock. So the B2s were then further subdivided into a B2, which was with good bone stock and was amenable to certain treatment principles, which Dr. Brown will talk about, and then B3s, which were poor bone quality. The unified classification system actually is a mnemonic, and the classification was brought about so we could talk about fractures around all types of prosthetics and not just proximal femur. There's type A, which is apophyseal, so greater trochanter. Type B is around the bed of the implant, as you see type B, bed of implant. Type C is clear of the implant, so it's distal to the implant. So far, we've followed the Vancouver classification um, through the first three types. It's when we get into type D, which is dividing implants or the interprosthetics. Type E or each of the two bones, and I'll um, expand upon that in a little bit, and then type F, which is facing an implant. So the apophysis or protuberance of the bone to which a tendon or ligament is attached is a type A. The type B, again, needs to be subclassified. So even though it's around or by the implant, bed of the implant, still needs to be classified as B1, which is um, stable, B2, loose with good bone stock, and B3, which is loose with poor bone quality. The type C's are clear or distant to the tip of the implant. This treatment is largely related to treating the fracture, which is the ones that I kind of particularly get excited about, even though I do a little bit of revision arthroplasty in my practice. Type D is dividing two joint replacements, so that's the interprosthetics. Type E is each of the bones supporting the arthroplasty are affected. So in a periprosthetic femur setting, you have pelvic discontinuity or fracture of the acetabulum in addition to a fracture on the femoral stem. And then type F is facing the implant where the broken bone isn't replaced. So in this example, you see that it's a cemented hemiarthroplasty with a fracture through the acetabulum. So again, A, B, and C are exactly the same as the Vancouver classification and help us guide our treatment options regarding um, the first um, three classifications. But D, E, and F do not indicate treatment actually. And we still need to think of each bone as an A, B, and C, whether or not it's proximal or, or an interprosthetic. And again, the value of the unified classification system is that it brought Vancouver to other joints, such as total ankles, um, proximal humerus, et cetera. So I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Brown. Hey guys. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the treatment of the periprosthetic fractures by classifications. <clears throat> we'll spend a little more time on the nuanced treatments for the class B. So type A, as we just heard around the trochanter, the fractures of the greater trochanter are common. They're more common, I think, around the time of surgery, especially uh, with more direct interior approaches becoming popular in the U.S. Uh, often these are treated non-operatively. I think this depends a little bit on the level of the fracture. So the fracture that we see here I mean, way below the vastus ridge, maybe a little less likely to displace, you know, opposing forces, pulling it up in the abduction and then pulling it down. Uh, treatment non-op is um, trying to judge it for success is maybe a little hard. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. We do get trochanteric escape, unhappy patients, lateral pain and weakness. 
uh, more common to fix with a cable plate like you see in the x-ray. So type A fractures are on the lesser trochanter, uh, a little less common. Always worry that this signifies a bigger problem. Uh, some metastatic disease is what we're taught to look for, make sure that you don't have a lesion in that region that causes a fracture as the iliopsoas pulls on the lesser trochanter. And then often a lesser trochanter fracture really signifies a deeper problem, as you'll see that in some of these cases with some subtleties. So this is a example where you might have called it a lesser trochanter fracture, but really it's further down, especially posterior and medially has caused the stem to subside. So clearly a B2, not really an A lesser troch. The type B1 fractures that we just heard, I think it's really funny. Uh, the two trauma surgeons like the fractures that are treated with uh, fun uh, internal fixation devices and the newer plates. Um, we probably have more fun in the joints world doing the revision work. But if you have a true type B1, um, what I teach people is to fix the problem the patient come in with. So you identify that the femoral component is stable. That comes with some knowledge of the implant itself, the design of the implant, the track record, the history of the patient. If you're really convinced that you have a fracture uh, around the bone, but with a stable implant, plating and stabilizing the bone, as you see in the x-ray, is the treatment of choice. I'm trying to differentiate between a B1 and a B2, understanding that the stem is actually loose. Uh, there's uh, a lot of review papers, a lot of algorithms. It can be a lot harder than you think. And at every uh, one of these AO meetings about periprosthetic fractures, we end up having an argument amongst the faculty. You know, is this clearly loose, clearly not loose? And you'd be surprised how often we argue. So I think experience helps a lot. Um, and then between a B2 and a B3, uh, I think that becomes a little more obvious and you have the B3 type bone. So algorithms help a lot. Um, I can't say that we go through this process a lot, but the idea behind each of these questions is what we think about when we see an x-ray from the residents in the ER. If a patient has antecedent pain ahead of their visit to the ER with the fracture, should be a little worried. Uh, if there's a bunch of comminution in the fracture around the femoral stem, you should probably be worried. Uh, I think advanced imaging can sometimes help, can show you fractures that you don't appreciate just on the plain films, so we get advanced imaging. If it's a cemented stem, then we'll go to the next slide and we'll kind of talk about the two different cemented stem designs, uh, but, but composite beam and then a polished tapered stem have very different considerations once the cement mantle has injury. Um, if it is a press fit stem, if the patient had an early fracture, uh, let's say subsidence in the ER a week after surgery, you're pretty suspicious that stem is loose, right? It's lost its initial fixation, maybe never had any. If you see any subsidence uh, change in the version of the femoral component on a cross table lateral, uh, very common to spin into retroversion, even with subtle subsidence, that's a clue that that stem is no longer fixed. Uh, thankfully, in today's world, we don't see major osteolysis around femoral components that often. If you do have a lot of osteolysis from an old polyethylene, conventional polyethylene, or cement wear, uh, occasionally metallosis, I guess, um, fractures through that is pathologic bone, almost never have a stable stem. And then figuring out what level of the stem the fracture is um, can play a big role, especially if you know the stem's design. And intra-op loose stem, that last thing in the algorithm, I think that's very hard. So some people argue for <clears throat> opening the hip and tapping on the stem every time to test its stability. I don't do that. I try really hard to figure out if it's stable and I'm going to plate and then I don't make an approach into the hip. I make a lateral approach. I plate the femur and I fix the problem that they came to the ER with. Um, testing the femoral component involves a posterior and anterior approach or transtrochanteric approach into the hip, pulling on the femoral component, then you have an instability problem that you've addressed maybe with a stable stem. So I try to make that decision ahead of time. So I think the most important is knowing the implant and then knowing the level where the fracture is. So we have a slide showing some of the more common stem designs. 
maybe there are a few new designs that maybe um, aren't included on this graph, but we can talk about those as well. And knowing where the ingrowth surface is, where is your stem getting fixation in the bone? So for these designs that we're looking at now, they're all proximally ingrowth stems primarily. Uh, if you have a fracture in this zone, you should be very suspicious that, that stem is no longer fixed to the bone. And you should take that stem out and try to get fixation distal to the metaphysis. If you have a fracture well below the ingrowth surface on some of these older stems that have on growth distal into the diaphysis, most of the time you can retain, if there's not comminution proximally, a big proximal fragment with a stem stuck to it and a distal fragment, a little better for the patient. For the designs in the top right, the conical shapes, the big rectangular blades that were sometimes used in the past or sometimes used for dysplastics, a lot of the fixation is distal. You have a fracture there, you should be very worried about the stem. Sometimes the proximal fractures are okay. It's, it's a very hard case by case to de depend on that. The fully coated stems, uh, maybe not as commonly used anymore, but used to be a mainstay for revision arthroplasty, get fixation through the entire length of the stem. Um, normally you can have a fracture at any level and still have a stable component of that stem. The challenge with these is over the long term, you get significant stress shielding proximally. You will have a lot of fractures through the stress shielding with a very small amount of fixation distally. So cemented stems, depending where you are in the world, uh, maybe cemented stem fixation is still very common. In the U.S., there's been a resurgence of popularity at AUKUS. We talk now about cemented stems for periprosthetic excuse me, for uh, femoral neck fractures for patients undergoing hemiarthroplasty, clearly a benefit for the pathologic bone. The left of the screen is a composite beam type stem. You always see these with a collar. Uh, if you see a collar on a cemented stem, it is a composite beam type. Very different fixation is designed to get stuck completely and absolutely to the cement mantle. If you see any radial lucency, like you do here between the cement and the stem that stem is loose any fracture into the cement and you have to take that stem out it is no longer fixed to the cement the polished tapered stem designs uh, this is a very common one are designed to sit within a cement mantle but are technically not well fixed to the cement you can have radiolucent line like you do here at the centralizer up here at the shoulder and still have a stable stem So I think looking at the European and the British literature about uh, Vancouver B fractures around cemented stems is very interesting. Um, we talked about this with the fellow and the resident on my service this last week because we use a lot of cemented polished tapered stems. Um, and we see a lot of very interesting ways to fix these from across the pond. Um, and the composite beam design we just talked about if you have any fracture, you see any radiolucent line that is a loose stem has to come out. The polished tapered designs can be a little trickier. Um, a lot of research has shown in registry data that these might have a little higher periprosthetic fracture rates because they are loose within the mantle. They can rotate slightly and cause uh, early rotational fractures like you see here. Um, if the cement mantle looks okay and the stem can sometimes be stable, you can fix the bone around it. Hopefully avoid the B3 scenario where the bone around the cement mantle is unfixable and now needs a big allograft to try to reconstitute the bone stock. If the cement mantle is split, like you see here, there's a big gap between the stem and the cement, and then there's fractures through the cement mantle at multiple levels. You look critically at the cow car, the remaining piece, you see that that stem has subsided. The femoral head is well below the greater trochanter. This is gonna be a loose stem. Uh, you're gonna to have to redo the cement mantle, dig it all out, and then try for a different zone of fixation. So now I'm going to see control back to Mike and Dr. Leslie, and then we'll start looking at some cases. Great. 
Thank you very much. Thanks to both of you. Um, so that kind of gives us a good primer for what we really want to talk about tonight. And that's that's really the, the cases, the individual cases that are so different. And we know we have the good, bad, and the ugly with all fractures. And it's particularly true with these. And you know, this is really the, uh, the, the focus of what we're doing tonight. So I'll kick it off and we'll talk about this first one. So this was an 84-year-old uh, patient of mine who had a, a hemiarthroplasty of her hip. And uh, we can see here that it's a press fit uh, hemiarthroplasty component. And she has a uh, fracture below, for the most part, her stem, which doesn't really look like it involves her stem at all. Um, so when we're looking at these x-rays, in my mind, this is probably a stable stem. This is going to be primarily, uh, what would you say, Tim, primarily a proximal ingrowth stem? Yeah, it looks like an older style. I don't recognize it. Uh, ream and brooch, so probably in growth for the proximal third of the stem and then on growth distally. Yeah. So we should have a uh, so we should have a stem that at least on plain X-rays looks stable. Um, and my plan going into this was ORAF with a specialty plate of sorts to go ahead and give me some options uh, around this stem. So here. Uh, by routine, we, we we get CAT scans pretty often on these to try to identify any other fracture lines and things. Uh, Lisa, what do you what do you think? Are you, are you using CAT scans for most of these fractures, or we're not using CAT scans because, for in my experience, I'm going to span the entire bone. So whether or not if there's a small line that goes up into the implant. Um, that's going to be treated with um, plate fixation, cabling, and screws. So um, unless I have um, a suspicion that it's something significant enough that approaches the stem that I would want to be, that I would be concerned about um, a loose stem. Sure. Yeah, I think I, with all these options on plates now, we pretty much cover most of the femur no matter what. So, um, so great. So here we did get a CAT scan and it did show this line that went up. If we look on the uh, on the posterior border here, um, we see uh, we see here we've got this uh, fracture that comes up along the posterior aspect right next to the uh, linea. And uh, but we weren't too worried about it because we knew that we were going to go ahead and um, stabilize the entire bone, like Dr. Blackrick said. So um, here we see some fluoros from the OR. Uh, we see utilization of 18 gauge wire here. And then we see uh, the percutaneous wire passer, a little bit more proximal. Um, it does beg the question, um, any thoughts on uh, utilization of wire versus cerclage cabling? Either Lisa or Tim? Yeah, I haven't used I much of wire myself, to be honest with you. Um, I use old school cerclage. Yeah, I think trauma is, you know, when I talk to people at meetings, it's kind of split, right? Some people use the 18 gauge wire, use the um, the collet on the pin driver to spin it. And some people are tensioning using, I mean, that's what we get with the uh, beaded cables is the tension that you have a little bit more control over than the wire, but I think both work. Yeah, I think it's, it, depending on what you're doing with it, you just can't ask too much of the wire. Uh, but if your if your goals are simple with it, and you're going to get stable fixation above and below. I think it's a pretty good way to do it. Sometimes it's a little bit less invasive than the cable, knowing where to put the crimp anterior, posteriorly over the plate, wherever. So I think wires are more useful in keeping fractures reduced, and then I would use cables on my plate. Then so a lot of people will do it exactly what you did with your your wire. Use it just to keep it reduced as a kind of a reduction adjunct and then put uh, cables through the plate, but. Yep. Yeah, I totally agree. So um, just some thoughts here, you know, pretty basic fracture pattern, but um, we want to think about all the different things that we have and uh, at our disposal. It was interesting how uh, in our particular hospital system, we, we have developed one hospital that's primarily joint replacement and all the trauma is done at a different hospital they're only about a quarter mile away from each other but um it was interesting that at the more joint replacement hospital we didn't have vapor clamps we didn't have a collinear clamp we didn't have some of the things that we had for fractures but we just started to mix it all together and it's good to bring the worlds together because 
um, using the using the collinear clamp uh, as we did here can be very helpful and a little bit more minimally invasive for these patients and allow for really nice compression of uh, of these fractures. So, and then we just use the um, the different things within the plate itself: screws, cables, uh, offset holes, variable angle locking in some of these plates, and uh, all sorts of ways to uh, achieve what we want, which is uh, stable fixation above and below um, this fracture. So. Great. Any other comments on this particular case? All right. So we'll move on now, and Dr. Blackrick will uh, show us a case of hers. Maybe. <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay. So I had a, uh, an 81 year old ground level fall while trying to. Let me see if can I go back? not letting me go back. She's trying to step on a bug. If you've ever been to Florida, and thankfully we missed the hurricane this time, but we've got these big palmetto bugs, which are basically a fancy name for cockroaches. So that's what roach. she was trying to do. Yeah, it's a roach. So anyway, um, so she was trying to step on it and she presents with this interprosthetic fracture. This is the, the great x-ray that we get from the trauma bay where we have, um, it, it's not a, um, total hip replacement, but she has a uh, cephalomedullinary proximally and then a total knee distally, which, so we don't have to think about whether or not we have implant loosening, et cetera, but I think it's a good a application of what to do in this um, fracture pattern, even though it's not exactly a uh, total hip arthroplasty. So the surgical tactic, you could, there's like a couple things that I run through in my brain. You could do minimally invasive bridge blading where you just connect the bottom to the top but what's that really going to do for her functionally and from a healing standpoint? You could also think about percutaneous reduction, lag screws and neutralization plates, or even go to an open reduction, lag screw and spanning plates. And then you have to think about distal femoral versus proximal femoral plates. What, do you, what is available to you in your hospital? What do you have um, familiarity with? What are you used to working with? Another thing that I, would put into my arsenal is retrograde nailing with plating of the junction. Sometimes that's sometimes that's a great option um, for in my hands someone who I want to reestablish a medial cortex. If you have a lot of comminution and you don't want to do um, laterally based plating or dual plating, and again this is coming from a trauma perspective where there's a lot of talk about dual plating of femur fractures, distal femur fractures. So and this is kind of how this is behaving, right? Uh, and then where you think about harder removal in this instance, not in a um, total hip arthroplasty and then nailing. So any thoughts from the panel about how you would uh, address this? Yeah, I think it's really well said, everything that you were talking about there going into each one of these decision-making processes. And, and, you know, Tim said something earlier about treating the fracture at hand. You know, I think there's a lot of, I know I myself, I think a lot about, oh, what else can I do? What else can I do? But getting this this uh, device out of the proximal femur is not always easy. And it does add a certain complexity for the patient. Um, and maybe it is not beneficial. So it's, it's definitely, I, I think you have to take your individual patient into account. Yeah, I think um, from our world, we see this problem a lot with a long hip replacement above um, a total knee replacement with these fractures come in constantly. I think in the joints world, a lot of us have gone to nail plate combinations. You know, I don't know that we're savvy enough to do a plate on the medial femur and a plate on the lateral side and percutaneous and things like that. So I think for us trying to pull it out to length, put a retrograde nail in, you can be really careful that you don't, uh, you know, you have something bridging the stress riser that you create in the middle of the bone between the two nails. So some kind of lateral plate and then a retrograde nail, I think from our world is what we would try to do. So that's, ex uh, let me go back to my fluoros here. So it's exactly what I decided to do in this woman who, um, someone's advancing my screen. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I'm trying to go back to the fluoros. So of course, when you're doing retrograde nailing through a total knee, you always have to make sure that you know what kind of implant it is to make sure that you can get a nail on how big the box is. 
And so I chose to do um, nailing and then I did through a very small approach, you know, cause I'm there in the infrapatellar approach to do the nail. And then I just kind of do a small lateral approach for where you see this plate sitting on the distal femur and then everything else is done percutaneously through a jig. So this is done in a fairly soft tissue friendly way. And I took my plate all the way up to the, to the blade there. And you'll see, you know, to be very critical of myself, she's in a little bit of varus for sure. I'd say about five degrees or so, um, but she's doing just fine. And I like to do these because I'm replacing that medial cortex. And it's really, um, it, again, the nail plate combo is becoming in vogue or it's becoming more of a, a, a standard implant uh, construct because you want to make sure, especially on the medial side, if you have a lot of comminution there, if this presented a little bit differently, you want to make sure that you can reestablish that cortex and not just hang everything off the lateral side. So whether or not that's dual plating or nail plate combos. And then what do you do for weight brain status for a patient like that? Because this is something we struggle with. It, it's always a, a sick 85 year old with bad bone. Uh, we're always worried about that little region where you've got fixation between the two uh, nails. Do you let them weight bear fully right away? I do. There are very few patients in my practice, long bones that are not immediately weight bearing. So that's my whole goal. It, 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 you know, we always say these people auto protect too, right? Like did this lady get up and start stomping on palmetto bugs again? No, she kind of like limped around on a walker for a while. So, so again, if with the bridge plating, I would be concerned for weight bearing. Um, Sometimes when you're doing percutaneous techniques, it's hard to get that anatomic reduction with a lag screw. And that's where Dr. Leslie Mike was showing, like using cables to get that because they're a little bit more forgiving than a lag screw. And then you can do a full open reduction as well, um, but that can be a larger exposure. So in some of these people who are host compromised, it might not be as soft tissue friendly. It can be soft tissue friendly, but a larger exposure gives you a larger opportunity for infection. Um, whether or not you use a distal femoral or proximal femoral plate, I think, you know, talking about what are we trying to achieve here? Where's the fracture? What do I want to fix first? And then the retrograde nailing to support that medial compromised bone. This is very different than a guy that I did, you know, shortly thereafter that is a 62 year old gentleman. Now he's in a motor vehicle accident. So this is a very different injury pattern um, in that he's got really great bone stock. He's, you know, still working, still, you know, walking around doing all his normal things. So, I kind of gave it away a little bit, but any thoughts on maybe, Tim, how you would treat this? So I was answering your question. This is a different patient. It's a different knee replacement. Um, we don't have, oh, okay, we do have a hip above. Um, I think it's probably a similar treatment algorithm. I probably want a CT scan to look more critically at the, this is the question I was answering actually from Austin. Um, how do we judge stability of the femoral component of the total knee replacement? Because if you noticed on the last patient, a lot of these fractures come and exit right at the anterior flange mm -hmm. of the femur. It's where um, a femoral notch tends to take place. You have weak bone right there. Um, so I get a CT scan to judge. Sometimes you can't get good laterals. It's going to be very hard. And then I look on the AP and see if the medial lateral femoral condyles are blown apart. Um, but for this patient, I think a retrograde nail, if it's a CR implant, which it looks like it is, is a quick and easy way to get it done. And you have plenty of bone in the diaphysis there underneath the total hip. Yeah. And that's, you know, in, talking from your experience, you know, the, um, nail plate combo is very common. Um, for this one though, I chose to uh, do a minimally invasive percutaneous approach, get the uh, fracture reduced, lag it, and then place a spanning plate. I just feel like he had better bone stock. So you, if anyone's put lag screws in 85 year old bone compared to 62 year old bone, there's a huge difference. So in my treatment algorithm, I said, well, I think a lag screw is actually going to be useful here. It's going to do its job. And then I can protect that with the neutralization plate. And even this patient is immediate weight bearing. It's an anatomic reduction with, you know, um, absolute stability. And then it's neutralized with a, the whole bone is neutralized with the plate, giving me good screw options below and above. So,
So two, two similar fracture patterns treated two different ways based on host response or host characteristics. And, then and someone what asked, else? Dr. Blocker, sorry to interrupt. I, I yeah. someone asked a question technically when you're doing these cases. Um, I have a question for you about doing the retrograde nail because even if you have a CR femur, no box, you can technically put a 10 millimeter nail through the box most of the time. But with an anterior lift or a deeper dish polyethylene, it can be very hard to get it out of the way and know that you're not reaming through the plastic. So right. how do you expose it? And then technically the question uh, was asked, do you do the nail first and then plate around it or do you do the plate first? So I really rely on my implant reps to tell me whether or not what, what kind of, if there's a, a poly in there with a large post, like, I, I mean, cause I don't do primary total knees. I do primary total hips and revision hips, but I definitely re rely on them to say, Hey, listen, if you do this, but it's all, per so for me as a trauma surgeon, I'm doing just percutaneous approaches, uh, infrapatellar. I don't do expose the whole joint because again, larger exposures give you larger opportunities for infection, especially in a prosthetic joint. So um, I, haven't, I haven't been led astray yet and I should have more knowledge of that for sure, but I do rely on them to tell me what implant that is, what my boxes are, and whether or not I, I'll be um, impinging on the polyethylene, polyethylene if I'm going retrograde. When I do the nail, I usually do, so the nail, it, it's really, the nail is going to go where it wants to go, right? The box is only so big. So that, that's why you get some deformity in distal femurs if you're nailing through um, a, a total knee. And then it's also hard because you can't really put blocking screws in to dictate where that nail goes because you have a, a knee component there. So in, in in all honesty, I do the nail first because it's going to give me a little bit of deformity and I kind of rely on the fact that the patient has born qual poor bone quality so I can then use that plate. And you can see sometimes I can overpower it, sometimes I can't. That's one advantage of doing that. If you do the plate first, the problem is, is that you have to do all unicortical screws and you can't put your distal screws in. So in my hands, it's really just putting the nail in and shooting the distal screws of the distal femoral locking plate around the nail, because I think it'd be very difficult to get a nail in with your uh, distal yeah, screws in sure. already. Yeah, it's the same. You almost have to put the nail in first. And then some of the newer nails with a more aggressive bend distally for the retrograde nails are a little better for uh, periprosthetic fractures through a knee. But nail almost always, I think, we put in first and then the plate. Yeah. Uh, really great points here. And um, one of the things, and I see the differences here in, in what you did, Lisa, the uh, utilization of, I actually find that utilizing smaller uh, smaller diameter screws actually a little bit better for these uh, uh, really um, osteoporotic uh, femur fractures. I typically won't use like four or five screws if I'm, if I'm utilizing a, a large fragment set. I'll typically pull out a set of three, five screws in order to get better fixation. I didn't know what your thoughts were on that. Um, I think it's a very, um, I can't say it's something that I've thought about for sure, but you can see that I've used smaller screws here. So it's mainly for me in the large four or five screws that you're not getting a lot of threads across that osteoporotic side. So it, it, we do that with almost any fractures, right? If we have concerns of like even in a distal fibula, I use two four screws as my lag screws as opposed to three fives because of that extra purchase. So if I'm feeling that there's not a lot of purchase with my screws, you can always, you know, bag that hole and downsize. Yep. Great. Awesome. So, uh, so I think we'll go ahead and we'll go to our next cases here. Some great cases there. And uh, Dr. Brown, I think you are up next. Uh, is that correct? Or oh, no, Lisa, you have one more case. Oh, sorry. I just relinquished control. Um, I'll request it again. Okay. Um, so this is a 90-year-old woman um, who came to me after, a, you know, she goes to the facility after her hemiarthroplasty. In 11 weeks post-op, she falls and has this fracture. Um, she was an independent, independent ambulator prior to her most recent fall, and she's a retired Navy, so she's really kind of a strong lady here. Mike, I'm not oh, here. Let me see. Okay, so surgical choices here, you know, so this is a, um, 
of B2 um, at the very least, right? This is a, um, a, a woman who's only 11 weeks out from an uncemented hemiarthroplasty. So surgical tuitions retain implant. Well, we've learned from the studies that retaining implants that are B2s and B3s have higher failure rates and um, higher reoperation rates in ORI for the proximal femur. I mean, it's an option, but you know that you'll be back. Um, the surgical choice to revise the implant and fix the proximal femur or do something like a uh, proximal femoral replacement or a PFR. What, uh, what would you say, uh, Mike, as a trauma, fellow trauma pal? <laughs> uh, so I, I, you know, it's, it's an interesting problem and I always battle in my head. You know, I look at this patient, 90 years old, very ambulatory. And some of these patients who get proximal femur replacements actually do so well. But, <laughs> um, but I find that it's just a huge, a huge dead space that you're creating around as you start to explant some of this bone and that prosthesis. And so I think for, for myself here, I would go ahead and revise the implant, but go ahead and use a uh, different type of fixation stem um, to go ahead and revise that, even though that proximal femoral, femoral replacement is so tempting, uh, I'll hold myself back. Tim, would you do a PFR? Uh, the indication for the proximal femur replacement is pretty rare. So you have to have really uh, bad bone. I mean, just disintegrated. For a patient that's really sick, you want a 45-minute surgery and you want them up and moving around. This patient, you know, looks like two or three big pieces proximally. It looks loose. You pretty easily be able to pry that off of the lateral fragment proximally. And then you can pot a stem distally into the diaphysis. She's got enough there, I think. It's a revision um, and then adding a plate on the lateral cortex. Okay, so thank you for those thoughts. I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly so we can get to some of your cases. But what I did, I used the uh, rest mod or the, the modular stem. I reapproximated the greater trochanter to where I thought it was supposed to be based off the lateral read. The implant came out uh, very uh, easily. And then using just uh, clamps and wires to keep the greater trope where it was supposed to be, I then utilized this uh, distal fit modular stem to uh, address the loose implant. And um, again, these are the x-rays that we get post-op in my institution. I hope other people get better ones um, in that we've given her a distal fit stem. We've plated the, the greater uh, trochanter to give her some function, functionality there as well. And um, for these, uh, I do make them touchdown weight bearing just because of the pull of the greater troch in this, um, you know, I do have two larger screws in here, but I just don't want that to escape, uh, which is possible. So I do touchdown weight bearing for anywhere between four to six weeks, so. Yeah, I really like doing that. And then if you go, back the fracture is almost like a big extended trochanteric osteotomy that also broke medially right to yeah. a femoral osteotomy it makes it very easy to expose if you have to work on the acetabulum it's like a gift right you can put in a cup very easily <clears throat> and then you can put a probe like a cable distally pod your stem and then kind of clamshell things back around it which is how I was taught to do it from a revision hip standpoint. You know, trauma surgeons sometimes like to reduce everything, make it look nice, and then ream through it. I think it's very hard to do that and turn the hip in the right way. And you're trying to ream a big long stem down. So uh, I think this is uh, probably the mainstay treatment implant choice for this kind of injury. Which, you know, so the thing is, is that there's a lot of us out here that do revision arthroplasty in the trauma world and there's some of us that don't so i think for the people who don't do revision arthroplasty what you really need to then become hyper aware of is determining whether or not that that stem is loose that was a very obvious example but then making sure that this patient gets to the to the right person yeah so i don't know if we can go back a slide i tried it's just not letting me but uh, so this is one of my patients and you, you guys will see staples and things on these because they just happened to come in the last two weeks. So this is a 78 year old patient. Um, he's a really interesting guy. He's a major league baseball scout. I really like him a lot. He has bad Parkinson's and a stress fracture of the femoral neck, just uh, such bad pain. He can't walk. 
So we treated him with a hybrid hip replacement and put in a prophylactic cable uh, because he has bad Parkinson's. He tends to fall. Thought we'd be okay. Cemented a, uh, a polished tapered cemented stem design. It has no collars. That's your clue. Cement metal looks pretty good. No issues with the surgery. Mobilized pretty quickly early on and did okay. The sniff called, said he had a bunch of delirium. Had a few falls, so they brought him back because he wouldn't put weight on his leg again. It says I'm controlling your screen, but it's not letting me control it. So I don't know, maybe advance. Uh, so he came back. Actually, this is the first time this has ever happened. He came to clinic, not the ER, um, two Fridays ago in a wheelchair with this new fracture. So the prophylactic cable held on, I guess. It tried its best, but you have a fracture all the way through the cement mantle, exiting laterally down there in the diaphysis. Um, and you can kind of see the subsidence. So I don't know if you pay attention to the original stem, but I think for us in the hip world, we look at subsidence. So the hip center is now below the greater trochanter pretty clearly. Uh, the shoulder of the prosthesis is down below the mantle and that lateral greater troch area. Uh, and the whole thing is now loose. So um, thoughts from you guys, how would you guys treat or address this knowing the stem design and how it's fixed? I think this is a, uh, a relatively long day of peeling cement out of there, unfortunately. Yeah, so this is when you feel bad about bragging about how good your cement mantle is if two weeks later you have to pull it out. Um, yeah, so this is uh, a cemented stem that's loose. The cement mantle is fractured, so there's no chance to get it back. Um, it's like the last case. It looks like a really big ETO, and in spite of the cemented fixation for the 80-year-old, he does have pretty good bones. So uh, I don't think we got a CT. He was pretty uncomfortable. Uh, we thought it was one big piece. So I think on the next slide... And the lateral doesn't look too bad. The next slide is show our plan. So also a modular fluted tapered stem. Uh, on the right is the intra-op, showing that we kind of pulled that lateral piece apart. You've got to see that I left the cement in place to protect it while we're putting our retractors in. And you know we're pulling really hard against the trochanteric fragment. It was all one big piece. Uh, we were able to pod the stem distally by about five or six centimeters a little more than we needed. Uh, we have that prophylactic cable, of course, we don't split it and make it really long day in the OR. Uh, we were happy with the intra-op, so that's what we did. And then we just cabled it back down like it was in trochanteric osteotomy. So we can do that last slide, I think is the post-op. Yep. Yeah, so those are post-op from a week ago or three days ago, I lost track now. Um, so the questions I'd ask to you guys, you know, some of my partners here at Houston Methodist love trochanteric plates, so they would have always plated this. Uh, for me, it's bone dependent, so comminution probably would have put a plate on it, um, not comminuted a big chunk like it's an ETO. I think cables alone and a lot of literature have shown to be okay. And if it's a B3, if that fracture had happened 20 years down the road, there's osteolysis, there's 30 pieces. Uh, sometimes I'm using allograft uh, on top of a new stem. You guys do anything? Yeah. Different? No, I think that's pretty much. Um, well, I do. I I would do plating just because it seems um, to me to be a more stable construct. And I guess I know that's a distal fit stem, but I still want it to heal around that proximal uh, portion. So I, it's just my familiarity and what I'm comfortable with. But with the B3s, I think you're right. You have to either uh, use an augment such as a, an allograft. Um, did you say that you would cable with the allograft too, or would you go to plating them? Uh, depends. I think I've got an example later where I just used an allograft, uh, did not put allograft and plate, and then I've done uh, with a lateral plate and then allograft anteriorly too. Mm -hmm. I yeah, just so think that the, the different. I think the difference between joint surgeons and trauma surgeons are that y'all like to use a lot of cables and we like to use a lot of plates. And I yeah, think it's true. whatever works in your hands. <laughs> yeah, I think for us, you know, we talked during this case about the literature for bone stock reconstitution after troch osteotomy. 
So as we've had an evolution of stem design for revision, and almost all of us are showing x-rays of a modular fluted tapered stem, right? It's uh, for everybody listening, it's a splined long conical uh, implant that goes tapered down into the diaphysis, gets fixed, and then you attach a proximal body, different sizes and offsets proximally. Um, that's become the workhorse. And then long-term data, ETO bone stock reconstitutes with two or three cables. So if you listen to the European joint surgeons, they're very minimalistic. I mean, they'll put two cables total and they don't like open cables either. They'll take wire and spin it with the collet, just like you said earlier. And they'll put two Lukey wires, things like that. So we're pretty minimalistic and um, I think it works fine. We'll see. If next time we give a webinar, we have a, a prosthetic fracture that goes down into his knee, I'll just keep adding to it. <laughs> Great. All right, so uh, maybe we have time for one more case at this point, Tim. Yeah, I can do this case quickly. I think this is an interesting one, uh, similar patient. So this is almost a 90-year-old patient, really stiff ankylosing spondylitis, uh, came and saw me, tried to get him through with injections, and he was miserable, had collapsed femoral head. So we did a hybrid hip. I used radiation. This is about the only patient where I'll radiate to prevent HO and stiffness, the AS patient. He did fine initially, loved it. Um, came back and while we were planning for his right hip as he's gotten worse over the last year, uh, we noticed a little crack. It's hard to tell if you guys can even see it uh, immediately about the level of the lesser trochanter. So we got to notice it on the x-ray. I didn't know what to think of it. This is the polished tapered stem. So that little crack doesn't necessarily mean it's loose, but maybe there can be a little bit of motion, which uh, normally is tolerated okay. However, we did his right hip did great. He's uh, mobilizing as best he can. He has no issues. And um, I'd say three months uh, or so, I can't remember the exact timing. He stopped weight bearing on his left, came into the clinic in excruciating pain, which is very unusual for him. And we got a new x-ray and he's got kind of uh, extension of this crack medially. We got a new x-ray and you can see it on the magnified view here. Uh, made us a little concerned that maybe that stem is rotating. So as you sit and stand, if the stem is rotating, really where you're going to have a rotational injury. We got a CT scan, showed fracture posteriorly about the level of the lesser trochanter, right where that crack is, shows a highlighted version of the crack. And then um, there's even some callus, so it, it must be moving for a while. So we took him back to the operating room and we did... Uh, a British style treatment, I think here. So we put a trochanteric plate on the lateral cortex on entry, like on approach, because he had a non-displaced stress fracture reaction. Um, after we had it fixed, and it was stable. We dislocated the hip, made a posterior approach into the joint, removed the implant. So it's a, a polished tapered design. You can grab it and slap it out. We took away a few pieces of the broken cement. You could actually see on the posterior medial cow car, a little crack. Um, and then we used runny cement, really hot and really liquid. And we cemented the same stem back down. Um, and then he got up and walked right away. All of his pain was gone. So he's three or four weeks out now. He's doing great. The cement and cement revision is something that gets a lot of eyebrows raised here in Houston, but uh, really popular for this stem design. Uh, especially in the European and the Exeter data um, from England. So anyway, another interesting treatment for treating the B2. It's a loose stem. Um, you had to revise it, but you don't have to go big down into the diaphysis and dig cement out for three hours. I think that's great. You know, you really saved the patient a lot of uh, morbidity associated with uh, taking that cement mantle out of there. And uh, so, yeah, it's great, great case. So... So we're going to uh, we're going to actually going to stop uh, cases right now. I'm going to go ahead and skip to uh, a practical demonstration of utilization of uh, a periprosthetic specialty plate. Uh, so uh, we'll go ahead and bring that up. Today we're going to demonstrate stabilization of a B1 type fracture of a femoral shaft about a well-fixed femoral stem. The fracture that we have demonstrated for us today is at the tip 
of a well-fixed femoral stem, which we see demonstrated here within the synthetic bone. The fracture pattern is a short oblique pattern, which in good bone would make an excellent opportunity for primary bone stabilization with an interfragmentary screw compression, followed by neutralization on our exposed surface, which is the lateral aspect of the femoral shaft. Our first step would be to go ahead and expose the femur utilizing an extensile lateral approach, and then to go ahead and safely compress the fracture utilizing point of bone reduction clamps and or any other clamps available to us. Once we've done that, we can go ahead and apply an interfragmentary screw, allowing for stabilization of our fracture and to make it much easier to apply our plate to the lateral aspect. That I have demonstrated here on our synthetic bone model. Here we see one 3.5 millimeter screw that has transfixed our fracture and is allowing us to have a stable surface to go ahead and place our neutralization plate and protect the entirety of the femur. This can be quite successful even for more complex fractures of the proximal femur around a stable stem. The two plates which we are demonstrating today include one plate which does not have a greater trochanteric extension that goes ahead and applies to the lateral aspect of the femur just below the intertrochanteric ridge. It's centralized on the femur and extends down towards the lateral epicondyle. If during the portion of the case, we decide that stabilization of the greater trochanter is necessary, there's an additional plate that can be integrated into the proximal end of the plate like this. There's a torque screwdriver that fixes it to the proximal end of the plate. And then we can go ahead and apply that all as one unit to the proximal end of the femur, allowing for placement of multiple 3.5 millimeter locking screws about that greater trochanteric segment. We can see here that that can demonstrate excellent stability of the proximal end if we need it. The other plate is one which already has stabilization of the greater trochanter integrated into it. That's a greater trochanteric hook plate that fixes to the side of the femur and extends down towards the lateral epicondyle of the bone. If we decide that our particular patient has advanced osteoporosis and we want to stabilize the entirety of the femur to protect this patient against a supracondylar fracture, we can also apply an extension plate. That extension plate integrates into the locking screw holes of this plate. We need to overlap it by at least three holes and then we can go ahead and apply 3.5 millimeter screws into the distal segment of the lateral epicondyle, thereby hopefully protecting the patient against future fracture down in that region of the bone. Additional features of both of these plates, which allow for adequate stabilization around the proximal end of the well-fixed femoral stem, include screws 3.5 millimeter about the plate anteriorly and posteriorly. And we can also apply our standard extension plate into the locking holes of the plate, which allows for access to the anterior and the posterior aspects of the femur while still maintaining our primary plate fixation. The other part of this plate, which we'll demonstrate today, is that the hook not only integrates into the proximal end of the femur, but allows integration of cables into the plate itself to get fixation around that greater trochanter or around the proximal end of the femur, whatever our fracture demands. For this particular exercise, we have the same exact fracture model. We see here that we have the B1 type fracture that has been stabilized utilizing a single interfragmentary screw applied from the lateral side to the medial side. We've then gone ahead and applied a lateral plate along the lateral aspect of the femur from the greater trochanter, extending all the way down with our primary plate to just above the supracondylar region of the bone and then applied an extension plate, which goes all the way down towards the lateral epicondyle. We can see here that the goal of this fixation is to not only neutralize our construct, but to gain access around our femoral stem and to go ahead and prophylax the end of the femur well beyond the zone of fracture, but our patient is elderly and osteoporotic, and we would like to make sure that we protect the entirety of the femur. This plate has been fixed to the bone, utilizing the hook of the plate, and then two 4.5 millimeter screws already. And we're going to go ahead and add screws through the attachment plate, through the primary plate, and into the femur itself. We'll do this with non-locking screw fixation. This is a 
3.2 millimeter drill that goes through each of the plates. We can go ahead and measure our screw at 50. And we'll then go ahead and apply our 4.5 millimeter Cortex screw that actually goes through both of the plates. At this point, we would like to gain access around our femoral step. Although we have the interfragmentary screw and the hook fixing the proximal segment, we'd like to take this opportunity to add stabilization about the entirety of the proximal femur. There are a few different ways to do that. The most standard way, and the way that we've used for a long time, would be to apply a standard unicortical periprosthetic type screw that will abut the femoral stem. We would go ahead and use our variable angle guide here. It will click into place in the plate. We feel ourselves abut against the femoral stem and then we can apply our flat periprosthetic screw with our torque limiting screwdriver. And we will go ahead and have our length stability by our unicortical screw fixation there. If we wanted to go ahead and pull the plate down to bone, or we feel that we don't have enough access around the femur itself, we can go ahead and apply standard cables from posterior to anterior. We would go ahead and place our cable passer, followed by passment of a cable through the anterior aspect of our cable passer, bring that around the back And we could choose to either integrate the cable itself into the plate through an eyelet that attaches into the variable angle hole. We can go ahead and tension that down and we can place our crimp box either anteriorly or posteriorly, whatever is most convenient to the surgical field. Additional modes of stabilization to the proximal segment can include either variable angle screw stabilization into the proximal segment utilizing 3.5 millimeter screw fixation or cable stabilization. If we go ahead and choose screw fixation, we can go ahead and take our 2.8 millimeter variable angle guide and apply it into any of the proximal segment holes. Once it clicks down into the four points, we can go ahead and drill And with the utilization of the variable angle, we achieve quite a long screw around our proximal segment. And then we would go ahead and apply a 3.5 millimeter variable angle locking screw, which in this set is delineated by a purple head into the proximal segment. 
making sure that we use the torque limiting screwdriver to hold that in place. One other option into the proximal segment is to go ahead and place a cable that actually integrates into the plate. What we can see here is that if we want to go ahead and fix around the entirety of the proximal femur, we can use a larger cable passer. Or some people will choose to go just around the greater trochanter and may use a different size cable passer to come around the greater trochanter and pass our cable. But in order to integrate into the plate itself, we first need to take the crimp and fit it into the plate itself. Then we go ahead and we take our cable, the non-beaded end first, feed it through the plate from back to front. And now that cable is integrated with into the plate itself. We can go ahead and pass our cable through our cable passer. Then we would go ahead and again, pass that cable from back to front. then we can go ahead and use our tensioner to tension that cable down to the plate by standard techniques and go ahead and crimp within the plate itself. The last feature of this plate, which I'd like to demonstrate for fixation of this particular fracture is the distal end of the plate. So here we've chosen to prophylax the distal end of the femur. This is standard with 3.5 millimeter screw stabilization and we go ahead and we get our variable angle guide and our 2.8 millimeter drill and go ahead and place a screw into the distal end. So here we see demonstrated multiple ways to go ahead and fix our femur with a B1 fracture utilizing interfragmentary screw stabilization and a specialty plate that allows access around the femoral stem and within the lateral cortical bone while still being able to utilize cable fixation and integrate into a greater trochanteric stabilization piece. Great. So uh, hopefully that was a little bit helpful as far as uh, going ahead and uh, utilizing uh, some of the subspecialty uh, characteristics of uh, some of these plates. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, so we'll go ahead and come back to uh, some of our specialty cases here. Um, so <clears throat> we have a few a uh, few minutes remaining, and what I'd like to do here is just go ahead and utilize uh, some of the really uh, complex cases that our faculty has brought for you tonight. So we'll just take a few minutes to go through each one of these cases, and then we'll adjourn for the evening. So. Uh, Dr. Brown, I believe you're up first. Yeah, is it okay if I just have you click through? So, sure. So this is a patient, uh, ninety year old male. He'd had this fully porous coated cylindrical stem placed twenty to twenty five years before I met him. Uh, I remember him really well. Super fit guy. Presented to the ER after feeling a pop. Wasn't really complaining of pain. Had no pain prior. Uh, loved his hip replacement and the hip replacement surgeon. Uh, the resident called from the ER, the University of Iowa, and said that the patient had a broken femur, and what would I like to do with it? I think I wanted to plate it, and this is the answer. Uh, we go to the next page. So that's a special fracture pattern. Uh, we don't really have a classification for it. I think somebody was asking. Uh, I would call it a B3, because if you go back to the original implant, this fully coated design, if you go back and you uh, look at Miller's and some of the early biomechanical work, the implant becomes fixed throughout the entire length from the metaphysis down to the middle of the shaft. Uh, there are several companies made these, became very popular in the late 90s, early 2000s. When you get up and walk, the implant is fixed distally and all of the stress of weight bearing bypasses the metaphysis. So you end up with such stress shielding 
you have really interesting fractures around the proximal stem and still a stable potted stem. Stem is also made out of cobalt chromium. It is very heavy and very hard to get out. Normally to remove these, you have to cut them with metal cutting burrs. And I mean like four or five. So normally we, we would leave the room and let the fellow try to cut the stem in half. And then we'd come back with three or four trefines. So circular, essentially circular drill bit to go around um, the stem up and down to get it out. Very hard cases. So I think he just kind of did the first and the hardest part for us by breaking the stem. We take out the distal part, take out the proximal part. Uh, again, use a modular fluted taper design stem potted distally. And this one, I used a couple of allografts laterally and then anteriorly. Um, the patient was doing planks in his room on post-op day one. Uh, he did fine for the years that I followed him. And his left hip never, I thought for sure he'd come back for his left hip and he never did. That's great. Once again, lots of cables. The uh, So the last things I just want to remind everyone about in the last couple of minutes, um, you, you definitely have some special circumstances that happen. And I think sometimes we get so caught up in the fracture that we forget about infection. Uh, and a lot of times when we see all this osteolysis or bony changes, we really have to think about uh, infection being a possibility. And um, one case that came to my mind when I was thinking about this concept was a 65-year-old woman who had uh, total hip in the community locally, uh, but she was clearly morbidly obese, BMI well over 50, and can't even really get good x-rays. And five days post-op, she had fracture and subsidence, probably happened on the uh, sentinel surgery, uh, just because of the location of it being in the calcar. And uh, so this patient got a revision. Um, revision, by all standards, everything that we've been talking about tonight makes a lot of sense here. Diaphyseal fit uh, with some cerclage cable fixation. Uh, the articulation was appreciated. The hip was brought down to where it belongs. So really everything we've been talking about tonight. But she fell again. And now she had a more complex fracture. Now she has a uh, B2 fracture with instability. Um, so this particular case goes on and gets plated. So everything we've been talking about tonight. So uh, the surgeon thought that the implant was uh, stable within some of the bone here. I think that could be argued against, but uh, certainly a complicated fracture pattern. And this patient is now on her third surgery within two weeks uh, on her proximal femur. So she gets plated and she winds up presenting to my office eight months later, unable to ambulate. And uh, I guess it's kind of a theme there, Tim, two patients with complex problems presenting to the office who probably should be in the emergency room. Um, but this has been going on for a few months for her. And what happened was that she wound up with an infected periprosthetic fracture. So she had a large defect of bone. Obviously, this is a very difficult problem for this patient. Gets her hip explanted eventually with multiple INDs. And the decision was made to eventually do a Moscolet type approach. And uh, luckily for her, she, we were able to solve the, the infection problem. And she goes on to heal this and is ambulatory at now uh, one year post-op and then seven and a half, seven years post-op, um, really making a new femur for herself, but uh, minimally ambulatory, secondary obesity, but uh, was able to maintain her leg. So, you know, I think that uh, we see a lot of problems like this. And I think just not letting infection go as a possibility is probably the most critical thing uh, when we're looking at these patients. So. The time is 9.15, and we did a lot tonight. Um, what did we learn? Well, first of all, thank you for your attention tonight. Hopefully, you got a lot out of this. Um, we learned that paraprosthetics are going to keep coming, unfortunately. Uh, we understand loose versus well-fixed is probably the most important thing that we talked about tonight as we went through. That specialty plates are going to be helpful, but they are complex, and they are rather utilitarian in our approach to the femur. And that revision primarily includes cementless fixation, unless really that one setting where you can cement into an old cement mantle. And then I think we need to be aware of infection at all times and any, any and all the other concepts that are associated with uh, revision arthroplasty and complex fracture work. So I'd like to thank you all.
for your attention tonight. I'd like to thank the faculty, Dr. Blackrick, Dr. Brown. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, upcoming webinars, October 4th, Current Concepts and Treatment of Orthopedic Infection, and November 8th, the Distal Femur Fracture Management, which we talked a little bit about tonight, plates, nails, two plates, one plate, whatever's going to happen for those fractures. So thank you again for your attention. If you have any questions at all, uh, please feel free to reach out to us, and we'll certainly uh, try to get back to you. Thank you all. Have a great night. Mm -hmm.